My name is Miss Emily and I'm a children's librarian at the Ashboro Public Library. Today, in honor of spooky season, I wanted to take a look at one of the most well-known spooky authors from America. His name is Edgar Allan Poe. You might have heard of him before. He's known for writing a lot of spooky or sad or scary or supernatural short stories or poems. And today we're going to look at one of his most famous poems, if not his most famous poem, The Raven. But first I wanna take a little bit to learn about Edgar Allan Poe and his life and maybe why he writes the sad or scary stories that he writes. Edgar Allan Poe was born in the year 1809. That's over 200 years ago in Boston, Massachusetts, which is further up north. His mom was an actress and she was pretty good. His dad was an actor and he wasn't as good. Because his parents traveled a lot to act in different shows all across America, Edgar Allan Poe and his older brother and little sister stayed with their grandparents a lot. When Edgar Allan Poe was a little bit older, but still a child, his mom passed away and his dad wasn't around anymore, but his grandparents couldn't keep him and his brother and his sister. So they took his older brother and Edgar and his sister went to live with two different families. Edgar went to live with the Allen family, which is why we know him now as Edgar Allan Poe, even though his parents' last name was just Poe. But his life wasn't all easy after Edgar got fostered by the Allen family. When he became an adult, Edgar Allan Poe had a really hard time keeping down regular jobs, and many of the people he loved, including his wife, passed away. This made Edgar really sad, which is normal. And so a lot of his poems and stories often reflect those sad feelings in them. Poe's sad life experiences contributed to these sad and creepy short stories and poems that he's most known for and that made him famous. Even Edgar Allan Poe's own death is a mystery. No one knows what happened. Now, even more than a hundred years since Edgar Allan Poe has written all of the stories and poems that he is famous for, we still think of him as one of the spookiest and creepiest and most mysterious authors that is from America, and even in the genre itself. Part of what makes Edgar Allan Poe's writings so spooky or sad or mysterious are the literary devices that he chooses to use. Literary devices are basically techniques that authors use to help get across certain points, the points that they want to get across, or the mood that they want you to feel. So today, before we start reading The Raven, we're going to look at some of the literary devices that Edgar Allan Poe used in his own short stories and poems, including The Raven. And these are awesome literary devices that you can put in your own short stories or your own poems. Even if they're not spooky, you can figure out how to use them to make the tone or mood of your poem just how you want it. The first literary device I want to look at is repetition. Edgar Allan Poe uses a lot of repetition, and repetition is just what it sounds like. Repeating stuff. In the same way that you or I might repeat something to make sure that it's being emphasized or that people are listening to that information specifically, um, and showing that that's something important, authors can do the same thing. They can use repetition to draw attention to certain lines in their poems or their stories or certain symbols, the stuff that they want you to pay attention to. In pose writing, I think some of the repetition also makes it even more spooky. I don't know why, I just think it makes it kind of scary. Let me know if you think the same thing after we read it together. Maybe it's just me who thinks that way, and that's okay. Another literary device I want to talk about that's really important to the poem The Raven that we're going to be reading is the idea of personification, which is also exactly what it sounds like. It's giving an object or an animal that is not human, human-like characteristics or qualities. So, so for example, if I were holding a rock and that rock started talking to me, can a rock say something to me? Those are kind of things that happen to people, but we can choose to give those characteristics to objects or animals that aren't people. And when we do that, we make them like a person or we personify them. 
Lastly, I want to mention the way that Edgar Allan Poe is going to use rhyme in this poem. Now, you probably already know that not all poems have to rhyme, but Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven does rhyme. So I want you to pay attention to the rhyme pattern of this poem. Where is the rhyming happening? Is it just at the end of each line? And does the way that Edgar Allan Poe is rhyming his poem make you feel any differently about the poem? Does it make you feel sad, happy, excited, scared? And pay attention to this as we read the poem together. We're going to be reading The Raven from this graphic novel, which is called Poe, Stories and Poems, a graphic novel adaption by Gareth Hines. So a graphic novel is kind of like a comic. It's got a lot of drawings in it. You might have read some graphic novels before. However, this uses the stories and poems that Poe has already written and adds imagery to it. So rather than just imagining what's happening in the poem, we can kind of see it acted out as well. So you can also pay attention to the illustrations by Gareth Hines that are in this graphic novel adaption of The Raven. I do want to say before we start reading The Raven that Edgar Allan Poe does kind of use some hard or weird words sometimes. So if you come across a word that you don't recognize, you don't know, or you think sounds kind of funny, go ahead and consider jotting it down in a journal. And then after we finished reading it, you can go ahead and Google or go to the Oxford English Dictionary website and look up the definition. I do this all the time when I'm reading books that have a lot of weird or funny or just plain hard words. And I actually kind of come up with my own little weird slash hard word dictionary. So it's really fun to have like a collection of all those words that I used to not know and now I do. Now let's go ahead and jump into reading The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore! Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what threat is and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, 
but with mine of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, never more. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing a bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and a bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether temptest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. 
And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. So I want to ask you guys some questions now, and if your parents give you permission, you can go ahead and respond in the comments below on our Facebook post or our YouTube post. But what I want to ask is, what did you think of that poem? Did you think that the beginning of the poem felt different from the end of the poem? If you didn't, that's okay. And if you did, that's okay too. But why did you feel that way? What about the raven? Why do you think the raven was there? And do you think that the poem felt kind of different before the raven showed up and after the raven showed up? Last question, and this is kind of a fun one. Why do you think Edgar Allan Poe chose a raven instead of some other kind of a bird? Why couldn't the poem be called the parrot or the blue jay? Why a raven? Remember, there's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions. The great thing about reading is that we can all interpret things differently. What I think is spooky or funny or sad, you might not. You might think something completely different. And that's awesome. Personally, I think The Raven is kind of a spooky poem, but I also think that it's really sad. I think that the repetition in the poem isn't very scary at first, but the more it's repeated, the scarier it gets to me. Like it gets past a normal amount of repetition and it goes into a spooky amount of repetition. And I also think it's kind of sad slash spooky because we can see the narrator's feelings changing, but the raven doesn't change. The raven just says that one word over and over again. Never more. Why? Let me know what you guys think. All right, thank you guys for taking the time to learn about some cool literary devices and read The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe with me today. I wanted to introduce our poet tree, which is our tree for poets and authors and different genres that we might look at when we're doing Creative Writing Corner. I've already went ahead and put up our picture of Shel Silverstein on it since we did him for our first Creative Writing Corner. And let's go ahead and add Edgar Allan Poe this is what he looks like, and we're going to pop him right onto the tree. That way Shel Silverstein's not so lonely. All right, before we say goodbye, I wanted to give you guys a writing prompt that you can do for the next month. You can choose to do this prompt. It's obviously not homework, so you don't have to do it. These writing prompts are just so that if they sound interesting to you, you can go ahead and choose to write about them. You can write about them in any format you like. Uh, you can do a scary story, you can do a funny story. And if you like, you can call the Ashboro Public Library Children's Room to set up a curbside pickup to pick up a cool little notebook that we're giving away. It comes with a little sticker so you can show your creative writing pride and you can go ahead and call the Ashboro Public Library to pick one of those up. So let's go ahead and do our writing prompt for this month. No peeking. And a writing prompt is, have you ever read a book written by Dr. Seuss? Write your own Seuss style story, complete with rhymes and made up words. So if that sounds interesting to you, or you feel like making up some new words, you can go ahead and follow that prompt and write it in any notebook you have at home, or you can write it in your creative writing journal. You can also try and fit in the literary devices that we talked about in this creative writing corner or in last creative writing corner into any of the prompts that you're working on or any other creative writing that you're doing. Bye guys, I hope you have a great week and enjoy the rest of spooky season.